Welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Lord, we thank you that your purpose is to give us your victory. And for us to see your victory outworked in our lives, in the circumstances, all around us. Thank you that you have called us to be overcomers. And we thank you, Lord, that we can be overcomers because you give us the victory. And Lord, we want to learn how to walk continually in that victory. So we ask that your Holy Spirit opens your word to us, that faith will arise in our hearts. That we will appropriate what you say in your word so that it finds substance in our lives. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's be seated and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 7, in Christ we have been redeemed with his own blood, let's have this down, it's booming away up there, with his own blood he has made it possible for all our sins to be forgiven and so has purchased us with the price of his blood so that now we belong to him. All this is the result of the immense riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Yes, he has given us wisdom to receive this grace and to understand the wonderful ways in which he has blessed us. Anybody expecting revival? Yes. There's one subject that is always at the heart of revival. If you... Read your history books on revival. You will see that this is always central. And hymns and songs that come out of revival are always focused on the blood. So if we're going to be moving into revival, we will need some new songs about the blood. We're expecting in our uh, non-conference days at the end of this week (coughs) for a move of the Spirit. Any move of the Spirit is linked directly with the blood. Without the blood, there will be no moving of the Spirit. What does the blood signify for us? Well, it signifies our complete forgiveness. Your forgiveness is in the blood. If forgiveness wasn't in the blood, you couldn't receive forgiveness. Your healing is in the blood. It's not just in a phrase, by his stripes we are healed. That phrase is true because your healing is in the blood. Whatever it is that the enemy may ever attack you with, your deliverance is in the blood. And whatever way you need to be victorious... Your victory is in the blood. Thank you for being so excited. (laughs) Your forgiveness is in the blood. Your healing is in the blood. Your deliverance is in the blood. Your victory is in the blood. 
Because when Jesus shed his blood, he overcame all the power of the enemy. The shedding of his blood was the judgment upon Satan, the judgment that will finally be enforced when Jesus comes again. Now, there's a simple question we have to ask first of all. Does the blood need to be shed or has it been shed? The obvious answer to that is it has been shed. So your forgiveness in what is in what has happened. Your healing is in what has happened. Your deliverance is in what has happened. Your victory is in what has happened. So when we pray for any of those things, we're not praying for God to do something new. What we are, in fact, doing is applying the blood. We're taking hold of the forgiveness that is in the blood, the healing that is in the blood, the deliverance that is in the blood, the victory that is in the blood. You see, if you think you have to get the victory, you're mistaken. You can't get the victory in anything. You can only apply the victory that is in the blood. You don't get the victory. The victory has been won. You take the victory in the blood and you apply it. Just like you don't have to do anything to be forgiven... You take the forgiveness that is in the blood and apply it. You don't have to do anything. You cannot do anything to get healed. You take the healing that is in the blood and you apply it. So faith is not expecting something to happen but believing that it has. Total forgiveness in the blood, total healing in the blood, total deliverance in the blood, total victory in the blood. Now the church moves into revival when it believes that. Because the Holy Spirit cannot be put on top of unbelief. That's why God's purposes are always fulfilled through repentance, which, of course, is applying the blood, and faith, which then links the blood and the work of the Holy Spirit. So if we're expecting a great move of the Spirit without repentance, we'll be fooling ourselves. If we expect great things of the Spirit without the blood, we will be deceived because what the Holy Spirit does is to apply the blood. You see, the Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus has done, declares to us what Jesus has done. The Holy Spirit says, look at the blood. The blood stands between us and judgment. We will not suffer the judgment we deserve because of the blood. We do not even have to suffer punishment that we deserve because of the blood. So we need to be constantly praising God for the blood. You see, throughout the Old Testament, and we'll look at an Old Testament passage in a moment, the people of Israel looked to the Lord to be their victory, to give them the victory. They were aware that if the Lord didn't fight for them, then their enemies would overcome them. Because their enemies were much greater forces than the forces of Israel could summon.
And that's even been the modern history of Israel, that a little nation has prevailed over much greater nations, even when those nations have conspired together against them. But when Jesus died on the cross, a victory was established for all time for those who believe in Jesus Christ. God no longer has to fight for us because he's already fought and won the battle. The mighty warrior who leads us forth into God's purposes is the one who has been victorious, which is why we are assured of the victory. That nothing and no one can stand against him. He has to prevail. (laughs) So he does give us the victory and we can't have the victory without him because the victory is in the blood. (laughs) Sounds good, doesn't it? But you see, it's no use it sounding good unless you apply the blood. It's not meant to sound good, it's meant to do you good. So faith applies the blood. So faith is not expecting God to do something. Faith rests in what he has done. And we expect certain things to happen because of what he has done. But it's not our faith in God's ability to do things that causes those things to to be done. It's our faith in what he has already accomplished that enables those things to happen. You see, if we don't believe that the victory has already been won in the blood, there's no hope for us. (laughs) Because that's like saying the cross is insufficient for our salvation. You see, he saved us from sin. He saved us from sickness. He saved us from the enemy. He saved us from despair. He saved us from judgment, all through the blood. So we must never get the impression that if we do this and this and this and this when we pray, then somehow that will convince God to give us the victory. Because prayer doesn't work like that. When we pray, God is is looking, not so much listening to the words, but he's looking upon the heart to see who believes in the blood. Who believes a victory? Who is resting upon that sure and certain knowledge of what God has done? So when we pray in the name of Jesus... We're praying through the blood of Jesus. Because, of course, the name denotes the person, and therefore we're praying in the good of what he has done. The name of Jesus means, of course, Savior, but it stands for victory. Not a victory to be won, but a victory that has been won. No matter what your circumstances. You see, often when we have a need, that's how we think. I have a need. So we think, I need to see God do this. I need to see God do that. I need to receive this, that, or whatever from the Lord. But actually all your needs were met in the cross. 
My God shall supply every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What's that about? Well, he shall supply because he is reigning in glory, having won the victory. Having won the victory on the cross. So every need that I have shall be met because he has already supplied the answer to my every need. Don't get too excited because it's Tuesday morning. You see, this is wonderful because when you get the revelation of it, you understand there can never be a need in the rest of my life that has not already been met. It's not, well, you know, there can't be a need that that God won't turn up and be gracious enough to do. You see, God has already manifested his grace in what he has done through the blood. So there can never be a need in my life that has not already been met by what Jesus has done in the shedding of his blood on the cross. I thought we might have a few believers here this morning, but we'll keep working at it until everybody's got the revelation. So... We are a people of freedom and liberty, not because we need to be set free, but because of what has happened in already setting us free, which is why Paul says to the Galatians, it is for freedom Christ has set us free. He has set you free from your sin. He has set you free from your sickness. He has set you free from the devil. He set you free from judgment. He set you free from punishment. It is for freedom. If by believing that, you live in freedom. This is why, of course, Jesus cried out on the cross, it is done, it is finished, it's accomplished. All in the shedding of the blood. The children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt. What did God tell them to do when he said that he was going to send the angel of death through the land to kill all the firstborn? (coughs) Put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels. And when the angel of death sees the blood, he will pass over. The Passover is not just getting the people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt through the Red Sea. It is the the blood that preserved them from the angel of death. Now, we've been passing over, crossing over. We are now on the side of victory. But in order to see that victory established in the lives of people, in order to see the number of people being saved and the healings we want to see and and all the rest of the fruit that will give glory to God, We need the blood. Or we need to apply the blood. And wherever we apply the blood, the angel of death will pass over. Whatever the enemy wanted to do, he will not be able to do. The blood, therefore, cancels out every negative. A few years ago, I preached a message at faith camp called The Blood Speaks. That message sold more than any other message that has ever been preached at any of our faith camps. 
I can't remember what the figures were now, <coughs> but it was amazing. We turned it into a short book called The Blood Speaks. I don't know that we've ever got a copy anywhere around because they just went. I think even, even my own personal copy got... I haven't got one now. <laughs> because it spoke, you see, right into where everybody is at. Because it doesn't matter where we're at in our Christian walk, we need the blood. We need to apply the blood. We need to be living in the good of what God has accomplished through his blood. So we praise God. What the Holy Spirit wants to do is to direct everybody's attention to the blood because the Holy Spirit will not give you a victory unless it's through the blood. See, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who guides you into all the truth of what Jesus has done through the shedding of his blood. If the Holy Spirit had to do something extra, the blood would not have been perfect. The work of the cross would not have been perfect. The Holy Spirit doesn't add to the blood. The Holy Spirit makes the blood effective in our lives. Makes the victory of the blood effective. So we need the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, you know, don't go and preach the gospel till you've received the power from on high. But what is the gospel? The gospel is not the Holy Spirit. Listen, nowhere in Scripture do they preach the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a sermon. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. You won't find anywhere in Scripture where they preach the Holy Spirit. They preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. They preach the cross. They preach the resurrection of Jesus, but they never preach the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the gift of God to those who believe in the blood. Oh, we need some teaching about the Holy Spirit, which is why there's lots of teaching in the New Testament about the Holy Spirit. But it, the Holy Spirit is not the substance of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ and what he has done and what he has accomplished. And the Holy Spirit is the promise to all those who believe the gospel. So when we believe and the Holy Spirit gives new birth and when we open our hearts, the Holy, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will operate through our lives so that we can take the message of the blood out into the world. You know, we talk about what we need to see as a move of the Spirit in this country. Well, actually, what we need to see is faith in the blood in this country. Then we will see a move of the Spirit. But we can't see a move of the Spirit without the gospel. The Holy Spirit is not a substitute for the gospel. He is the one who enables us to bring the gospel into people's lives. So the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit work together, not in isolation. So this is exciting because we are going to see some wonderful moves of God in the next few days. Not because we ask the Spirit to turn up and do something, but because we believe what Jesus has done through the shedding of the blood. Hallelujah. 
All we've got to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is apply the blood and see what the Spirit does. We just apply the blood in one area after another and people will be liberated because of what Jesus Christ has done. You see the mistake so many Christians make is they're praying for God to do what he's done. And if they're asking him to do it, it's because they don't believe he's done it. And God can't do what he's done. He's done it and he's saying, why don't you believe what I've done? Don't keep asking me to do what I've done. So faith is believing what he has done. Hallelujah, somebody thought. So I'm looking forward to the next few days. (laughs) You see, if you think, well... This is dependent upon whether God does something or not. Then there's a great big question mark. Well, is God going to turn up? Is the Spirit going to do this? Is the Spirit going to... What is the Spirit going to do? I mean, are we going to make it? Aren't we going to make it? Will it happen? Won't it happen? Whereas when you've got faith in the blood, you know the jolly thing has to happen because the victory has already been won and what you're doing is applying the victory that is already won. There's nothing about will God turn up or won't he turn up? Will he do this or won't he do that? Will people get healed or won't they get healed? If your faith is in the blood, of course people will get saved. Of course people will get healed. Of course they'll get set free. Of course the devil will be overcome. Of course there will be victory. Nothing else can happen. So we don't go into these days thinking, what is going to happen? We're going into these days praising God because it's all happened on the cross. And as we apply it, it's just four days of opportunity to wallow in what God has done. Just to soak ourselves in what he's done. Just to express our faith in what he's done. It's wonderful, isn't it? But you see, when you ask God to forgive you, you don't expect God to do something to forgive you. You're putting your faith in the blood. You're putting your faith in what he's already done. And you know that if you confess your, your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you because he is just in honoring the blood. That he doesn't have to do anything. He's done it. So you pray, Lord, forgive me. And you know he will because he's done it. Well, isn't it the same about healing? Isn't it the same about deliverance? Isn't it the same about provision? Isn't it the same about overcoming the enemy? He's done it. We only get unstuck when we don't believe he's done it and we pray in such a way as if he needs to do something because we don't believe he's done it. You see, God does everything perfectly. So the cross is perfect. We'll try that again. The cross is perfect. God didn't leave anything out. On the cross, Jesus met every need. So you translate that personally, and what do you come up with? He has met my need. 
Whatever it may be. He has. 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 Why do we pray at all times with thanksgiving? Because we know he has. Why does Jesus say whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it? Because he has. Not because he will, but because he has. Not because he needs to, but because he has. Now, it's no use assenting to that with your head because you hear it in the message and then praying as if something needs to happen instead of praying as if it has happened. This is where what is in the head has to get into the heart and has to be applied in the way we actually do things. We know the old has gone. So those who go back into their past or those who make excuses that they are what they are because of their past are living a lie. Because their past has been dead and buried with Christ. They have been crucified with Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. Now what is the new? The new is everything that he accomplished from the cross. It's new life. It's forgiveness. It's healing. It's deliverance. It's victory. The new has come. You see, the new is not just God dealing with all the old negative stuff, so now you're back in neutral. It's the impartation of all that he is because of all that he has accomplished through the blood. Well, I believe it. I mean... So you're looking shell-shocked this morning. This is simply the gospel. But then what is revival? It's believing the gospel. It's applying the gospel. How do you get revival? You preach the gospel, you believe the gospel, you live the gospel. That's revival. It's not the Holy Spirit turning up and wafting away in some dreamy way. Oh, have this wonderful spiritual experience. Revival isn't like that. Revival is the gospel coming alive in the church. That's what revival is. The gospel coming alive in the hearts and lives of God's people. Hallelujah. Turn to Psalm 44. Puparazata bakarasita pa. It's going to be difficult to finish this one in English. Puparazita pa. I'm just getting worked up. I'm, I'm getting into the mood for revival preaching. We're going to have some revival preaching. Amen. Psalm 44. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what you did in their days. Now, you hear a lot of what God has done in days past, but the only thing that matters to God now is what he's going to do now because you believe what he has done in days past. Not just what he's done in revival, but what he did on the cross. Because all those things that happened in the days past was because people believed in what Jesus did on the cross. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our fathers. You crushed the peoples and made our fathers flourish. That is, getting rid of all the ites. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. In other words, it was nothing they did that gave them the victory. 
It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you love them. Now this, of course, is a thousand years before the cross that this was written. God has done all this on the cross. He has shown the power of his arm. The light of his face has shone upon his people. He has poured out his life in sacrifice to give us the victory. Verse 4, you are my king and my God who decrees victories for Jacob. Now Jacob became Israel. We've been grafted into Israel. You decree victories for us. You decreed victories for us. Listen, what is God saying? He's decreed victory for you. He's decreed victory for you, for you, for you, for you personally. He's decreed victories for you. He has never decreed defeats. He didn't decree sickness for you. He decreed victory over sickness. He didn't decree sin for you. He decreed victory over sin. I think some guys need to be let in if somebody would go. He has decreed victories. Through you, through you, through you, we push back our enemies. (laughs) Come on. Is this going to be good or is this going to be good? I feel like some enemy crushing. You see, we're meant to be preparing for enemy crushing days. For victory days. Amen. Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. These are all the demonic powers. These are all the nasties that are against us. I do not trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. None, you know, nothing that you can do. But you give us victory over our enemies. And you put our adversaries to shame. In God we make our boast all day long and we will praise your name forever. (laughs) Hallelujah. So do we have to bind Satan? No. We don't have the power to do that. Turn to the book of Jude. Jesus gave us authority over all the power of the enemy. But the only one who has the power over Satan is God himself. Are you there? You know, I hear Christians say, I bind you, Satan. Listen, if we could bind Satan, there's so many people all over the world binding him today, he wouldn't be able to do a thing. Well, what about the scripture about binding the strong man? Well, who can bind the strong man? Jesus. Look, here in uh, verse 9 of Jude. But the archangel Michael stood against the devil when he disputed with him about Moses' body, saying, the Lord rebuke you. I was praying yesterday about certain things in connection with kingdom faith. And the Lord just said to me, why don't you ask me to rebuke the enemy? (laughs) for the way in which he's attacking you. 
I thought, yeah, that's a neat idea. <laughs> and then you think, why didn't I think of that before? Because you see, that's the battle Jesus undertook on the cross. And we can say to Satan and all his, the Lord rebuke you. And I've been praying yesterday, today, that the Lord will rebuke the enemy for every way in which he has come against us, every way in which he's tried to stifle the flow of finances into kingdom faith, every, every way in which he's sought to cause division or, or to do anything that would hinder the purposes of God. The Lord rebuke you, Satan! Amen. This is a precious work of God. The big mystery is that, and and it doesn't worry me, because we have got so much here that the nation needs. And that was true in the early days of the revival in Luton, and then suddenly God exposed all that was happening there, and it was like a mighty sort of explosion and it began to have influence all over the place. I believe that's what God will do here. Amen. That what we have here, that what others need, will suddenly something will happen and it will explode. The enemy is doing everything he can to try to contain it here. But it's time for all those restraints to be broken off. And I believe God spoke that. It was such a simple thing he said to me yesterday. I believe he did that because he's saying, this is the time for all those restraints to be broken off. This is the time when I'm going to move in such a way that people are going to see what I am doing here and will open their hearts to receive the impartation that I have given to you. Because these coming days are going to be days of impartation. But it all, it all focuses on believing the victory that we have. That, that Jesus has the victory over Satan. We have authority over all the powers of the evil one. We can stand against them because the Lord is standing against the one who is using them. Jesus is our general. Satan is the general of all those demonic forces. Our general is so much greater than their general because our general has already defeated him and our general is now coming against him on our behalf. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. So the demons won't know what to do because their master is bound, not by us, but by Jesus. He's bound the strong man for us. See, that's the victory. You see, we're not asking him so much to do something as believing he's done it. You bound the strong man. So he cannot come against us. He cannot prevail. He cannot start deploying his forces. And we come and we, I mean, we cut the heads of those demons off. Come on. The one who is directing them is defeated. Why? Because we've taken hold of that victory and applied it. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. So, the enemy won't be able to stop the abundance and the harvest.
the explosion of the impact. See, when Jesus says, first you've got to bind the strong man, he knew that he was going to do that on the cross. It's not for us to do. He's done it. Now, we're moving on the attack, you see, because we're going to plunder his goods. Amen. I was doing some of the notes for the study version the other day, all about Abraham and Melchizedek. I was doing the notes for Hebrews. And you just see how people completely, utterly, totally misunderstand the tithe. You know, it, it's become a we should give the first 10% to the Lord because it belongs to him. That wasn't what it was about. Moses has this encounter with Melchizedek, who obviously was a type of Christ. And he just won the battle over all the kings that had conspired against him. And he got all the booty from that victory. And at this vision of Melchizedek, he realized the greatness of the one he was encountering and he just falls before him in worship and out of gratitude and love in his heart, he gave him 10% of all the booty that they just got. It was an act of love, an act of worship an act of praise, an act of thanksgiving for the victory, for the victory, that he realized that behind the victory was God. God turns up and manifests himself. And in love, in gratitude, in thanksgiving, he falls before him in worship and gives him the 10%. (laughs) People aren't prepared to do that. How much love and thanksgiving is really in their hearts for God? I mean, we want to give him more. I don't know about you, but we give much more than 10% because 10% is nothing compared with what God gives to us. Praise God. But you see, it was thanksgiving for victory. It was worshipping the one who was behind their victory. The one who had enabled them to enter into all this glorious, abundant provision that suddenly was there. as more and more people get revelation of that victory just think of the release that there's going to come financially as well as in other ways I won't say we'll have a gold plated hub floor but I mean (laughs) everything will be done well And everything else too. Because something's getting turned around at present. And there isn't anything we need to do to get the victory. All we have to do is to apply the victory and therefore show our love and gratitude to God for the victory. 
not just in the tithe. I mean, that was just one way. But the tithe was accompanied by worship of Melchizedek. So the tithe is an act of worship. <clears throat> Praise God. I was going to say, is everybody happy? But I look at you and I, I think to myself, is anybody happy? <laughs> You seem deep in thought this morning. <laughs> but you see, God is just opening eyes to see what he has done. And we're going to pray in a moment. And I think many of you are going to pray in a different way about circumstances in your life. But you're not going to ask God to do what he's done. But you're going to apply the blood. You're going to praise him and thank him for what he's done. And you're going to offer yourself, like Abraham did to Melchizedek, offer yourself to him in worship, in praise and thanksgiving for the victory that he has given you. There is certain to be an area in your life, in everybody's life, everybody in this room, everybody who's listening on the, on the net, everybody will have an area in their life where today they need to apply the victory. You know, Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Now, that's Jesus speaking, and Jesus never spoke negatively. He, he, he wasn't wishing trouble upon us. He was just saying, this is what life is like. Every day there will be troubles. Every day there will be situations where you will need the victory. So it's guaranteed that today as you sit here this morning, there is at least one if not several areas in your life where you need to apply the blood. And you see, because each day has enough cares of its own, every day we need to apply the blood because every day we need to live in that victory. So it doesn't matter what is going to happen tomorrow. We don't have to anticipate what is going to happen tomorrow because we got the victory of the blood over it anyway. Amen? Amen? But God always wants us to start where we are. Now, one last thing. <clears throat> Means I've got about another four pages to go. <laughs> Do we have to get the victory then? No. We don't have to get the victory. He has given us the victory. Yeah. Right, you guys on the team gave me this on my birthday. I don't have to get it, it's mine, I've got it, but I do have to use it. I have to take it and open it and apply it and use it. Otherwise, although it's mine, it's not doing me any good. 
So you've got the victory, you've just got to take hold of it, open it, use it, apply it. You don't have to get it because you've got it. You don't have to ask for it because he's given it to you. Scripture doesn't say he will give us the victory, but he has given us the victory. So the victory is yours. You need to say the victory is mine. The victor gave me the victory. Hallelujah. Come on, let's all stand up. Never mind about the other four pages. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift your hands and begin to thank God that he's given you the victory. Don't start to apply it yet. We'll do that in a minute. First of all, thank him that he's given you the victory. He has given you the completed work of the cross. Hallelujah. He has given you the victory over sin. He has given you the victory over sickness. He has given you the victory over Satan and all his works. Hallelujah. The victory is mine. Just, just, just say it and praise God for it. Oh, thank you, Lord. The victory is mine. That you have given me the victory. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Purata parazata bakarazatuba. We praise you for your blood, Lord. There is power, power, mighty working power in the blood of the Lamb. Purata parazata bakarazituba. Come on, Jesus. Complete victory. Total victory. 100% victory. Perfect victory. In the blood. Balala no mazata pari elero bakara zituri zato ba. Balata pari ezituri zato ria bapara zato bakara zito ba. Bapara zato bakara zituri zato ba. Okay, now now let's begin to apply the victory. First, thank God that He's given you victory over temptation. Now you see you battling with an area of temptation is because you don't believe he's given you the victory over it. So stop battling and thank him for the victory. Thank you, Lord, you have given me the victory over sin and therefore you have given me the victory over temptation. I do not have to yield to anything that the world, the flesh, or the devil desires for me you have given me the victory over sin over temptation praise you Lord look victorious as you praise him look victorious as you praise him look victorious look victorious Look victorious. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 
Thank you, Lord. I do not have to yield to any temptation because you have given me the victory. Thank you. You've made me holy so I can be holy. You have made me righteous so I can walk in righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Now thank him that he's given you victory over all the power of the evil one. Oh, the Lord has rebuked Satan over your life. He's rebuked Satan over the life of kingdom faith. The Lord is holding Satan back, binding him, preventing him. And he has given you the victory over all those demonic powers and forces. Oh, he's given you victory over deception. He's given you victory over the lying spirits, over the deceiving spirits. He's given you victory over every unclean spirit. He's given you victory over every spirit of infirmity, over every sickness, and over every disease. Parata parazata bakarazituba. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you have any healing issue at this moment, He has given you your healing in the blood. Come on, apply the blood. Apply the blood right now. Oh, Lord, I apply the blood to my body. Right now, I apply the blood. Oh, I thank you, Lord, for the victory that you won on the cross with the shedding of your blood, that all disease, all sickness, all infirmity has to pass out of my body. It cannot remain in my body. No pain, no discomfort, nothing, Lord that is opposed to your best purposes. You have given me the victory. Hallelujah. Through your precious blood. And I praise you for that victory, Lord. Come on. We can really praise him. Don't look at your body. Look at the blood. Look at the blood. Look at the blood. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Poparazata bakarazato bakarazito ba. Purozotorisata parazato bakarazita ba. Hallelujah. Miracles of your healing grace for your glory, for your honor, for your praise. All because you won the victory for us on the cross. We give you glory, Lord. Now, any area where you feel you've been restricted and hindered, come on, those restrictions are being pulled down because Jesus pulled them down on the cross. It is for freedom Christ has 
set you free. Oh, there's not enough noise in here. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 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 Orala basata bakarazi tuba. Now he's given us victory for inside out. Come on, it's established. He's, he's done it. Thank him for four days of victory in the blood. Meeting after meeting, more and more victory. And thank the Lord that as the victory is established, more and more of the Spirit shall move freely amongst us. Come on, thank him. Victory over the whole of kingdom faith. Oh, hallelujah. Victory over all who will watch the streaming. There's victory is going to be spread all over the globe because he's won the victory. He has won. He has won. He has won. He has won. Oh. Do you remember at, at school when you had team games and a team leader was appointed and they picked people? And just depending on what it was, you were saying, pick me, pick me, or don't pick me, don't pick me. Well, you know, God looked and he said, who do I want on my victorious team? And he picked you. Come on, thank him. That he picked you. He said, you come and join my victorious team. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. We can praise him now. We can praise him. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. I'm on the victorious team. Hallelujah. I'm in the Lord's army. Hallelujah. Parasata bakarasata bakaya. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I did not choose you, but you chose me. Hallelujah. You chose me to be part of your victorious team. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, I pray for all those believers who are still fighting instead of living in victory. All those that are trying to get a victory for themselves instead of believing in your blood. I pray there will be such a revelation of the truth that will just hit them in their hearts. And they will be taken out of the bondage and restrictions and sicknesses and other things that afflict them. And they will come into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. 
And we thank you, Lord. We praise you for all that you did on the cross. Thank you that we can live in the good of that day by day. That it doesn't matter what each day throws at us, we have the victory over it. Thank you that when you suffered on the cross, you had in mind everything that we would ever need in the future. And you dealt with it all there on the cross. That you left nothing out. Thank you that the enemy now, now, Lord, that you have bound him on our behalf. The enemy's got no room for maneuver. And that in your name, we can just cut down one thing after another that comes against us. And we praise you. We praise you. Come on, let's just lift our hands and thank the Lord and praise the Lord and bless the Lord. Yes, there's wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. You know, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb. Just behold the Lamb for a moment. Just look at the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. And the Lamb is standing, Scripture says, in the midst of the throne, in the midst of heaven, looking as if he had been slain. How can a lamb stand and yet look as if he's been slain? Well, what do you see that tells you he's been slain? You see the blood. And there is the lamb standing in the midst of the throne with the blood. That has set you free. So now you reign with him. You are in Christ. Seated with him. In that place of victory and glory. What a mighty God. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Lord. You are so good. This really is your grace. Thank you that this is your true grace, Lord. All that you have done and all that you give to us because of what you've done. Praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Just turn to half a dozen people around you and say, I'm so glad to be on Jesus' feet. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.